Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Glenn Weil, and uh, you can call me Professor Weil, you can call me Glenn, you can call me by any nickname you come up with for me. Um, I, uh, I'm going to be giving three guest lectures in this course. This is the first one. I'll give two others, one covering decision theory and one covering the choice uh, by a monopolist of uh, non-price characteristics of their products, like the product quality. Um, Today, uh, I'm going to be talking about sort of the basics of monopoly theory. Much, if not most, of this course is going to focus on the behavior of consumers and firms when they make prices given. But I think it's useful to start out uh, the course with um, a consideration of what happens when these assumptions are violated. Um, and this is exactly what a uh, model of the market power incorporate, and I think these can be useful for three main reasons. First of all, they give us a more detailed and rich understanding of pricing behavior uh, once we take into account the fact that firms choose their prices, their uh, production, not just to maximize profit given prices, but also to affect uh, the prices that they face. Second, when we think about um, big areas of policy on which economics has had an important influence, such as antitrust, regulation, intellectual property, and so forth. The issues are sort of inherently about uh, how firms uh, price in a monopolistic fashion. And so in order to really study those issues, we need to consider models for kind of having influence over price. And finally, when you want to think about what the optimal policy is for the government to follow, the government is sort of the ultimate monopolist, right? And so almost everything it does impacts prices and markets. So you can often analyze many government policy issues, such as redistribution of wealth, uh, unemployment insurance, many other uh, issues, as applications of a monopolist's optimal uh, pricing uh, schedule. So sort of the foundational model in uh, analyzing uh, situations with market power is a model with just one firm, usually called the monopoly model. And um, this is what I'm going to try to develop today. So first I'll talk about the way in which control over a market influence over price gives an incentive for a monopolist to reduce his quantity below what would be uh, socially optimal, below the point where price equals marginal cost. I'll then um, quantify that using Lerner's classic elasticity pricing rule and talk about the inefficiency caused by that distortion, the dead weight loss of monopoly, um, and how to measure it. I'll then talk about the comparative statics of monopoly. So in competitive markets, we often start thinking about comparative statics by asking what would be, say, the incidence of attacks or something like that, and the basic logic behind that lets us analyze a number of different interventions in competitive markets. Similarly, when we think about monopoly, it's useful to think about the rate at which a tax is passed through to consumers, sort of uh, an analog in the monopoly case of the incidence of a tax. And um, that will allow us not just to analyze uh, that you know, one concept itself, but just as in the perfectly competitive case, we can also uh, connect it up with the way in which surplus is divided between the monopoly uh, and consumers, as well as the effects uh, that other types of interventions will have on the monopolist optimal strategy, such as a shift in uh, demand curve or a um, change in the price of one of our competitors. And finally, if I get a chance, I'll talk a little bit about empirical evidence on measuring monopoly demand curve uh, and thereby pass through rate. So, sort of the fundamental idea of monopoly theory, which it was quantified at least as far back as Cornell's work in the 1830s, but um, is, is probably much, much older than that, is that monopolies have an incentive to reduce quantities below what would occur in a competitive market in order to try to raise the price of those commodities. And the basic reason why they raise prices is because this is the only way they can charge more for the inframarginal units that they're selling. So those are the units that you know, are going to be bought regardless of whether the price is what they're currently charging or something higher. 
But the only way that you can charge a higher price for those units is to raise the price even on the marginal units in the market. Um, and this creates a basic trade-off for the monopolist between selling more goods and selling the goods that they do sell at a higher price. Um, and in particular, you can make, this can be quantified by thinking about the um, uh, monopolist profit function, which is uh, the price that it charges for its products, p, time, p of q times q, uh, times q, the amount that it sells, minus the cost. And if it's going to maximize those profits, it's not going to set price equal to marginal cost as a competitive market. Instead, it's going to set the marginal revenue, the marginal value of p, p times q, equal to marginal cost. Um, is chow chow here? Chow chow? Yeah, yes, I have. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. Um, could you tell me what the formula for marginal revenue is? For marginal revenue? Uh, is total revenue or the derivative of total revenue with respect to the quantity? But in terms of uh, like the price, the demand function and quantity? So 
So whatever the difference is between this and price must be a distortion created by monopoly. And in fact, it's very clear why that's exactly the distortion created by monopoly, because it's all driven by the fact that you changed the price. If you didn't change the price at all, if you took price as given, you would always assume P prime is zero, right? And so that exactly shows how this simplifies yeah. the competitive case. So before um, we go on to develop the elasticity interpretation, I just wanted to highlight um, some particular forms <coughs> of the um, marginal revenue curve. So the um, on the upper uh, left here, I've drawn a constant elasticity um, demand curve. Uh, on the upper right, I've drawn a linear demand curve. Um, on the bottom left, I've drawn an exponential demand curve. And I've drawn a quadratic demand curve on the bottom right, which is concave. And then the demand curves are in uh, blue, but their marginal revenue curves are in red. And you see that the, re the relationship between the marginal revenue and demand curve is very different across these different types of demand functions. So under constant elasticity, you see that as the quantity increases, the distance between the marginal revenue uh, and the demand curve shrinks. Right? Under the linear demand curve, they start at the same point, and then the distance between them grows at a constant linear rate. Under the exponential demand curve, they maintain constant vertical distance between one another. And under the quadratic demand curve, they again start at one point, but they diverge increasingly rapidly from one another. And the key difference between these different demand curves is their curvature. So the curvature of the demand curve is going to be a key variable which determines uh, how the relationship between the marginal revenue and demand curve looks. And we're going to focus on that quite a bit uh, a bit later in the lecture. But in the meantime, I just want to um, remind you of the way that graphically you can use the marginal revenue curve to determine the monopoly's optimal price and quantity. So what you do is you do the marginal, he's going to always maximize where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, right? And I um, have drawn marginal cost curves here, but imagine that they correspond to the horizontal axis in these drawings. Then what you can do is you can just find the intersection points, uh, like here. You can then draw, you know that that's going to be the optimal quantity. You can then draw a line up to the demand curve and over to the price that corresponds to that. And that gives you the optimal price under all these uh, various demand curves. <coughs> so, um, Another way that we can write the marginal revenue curve is the price times 1 minus the inverse elasticity of demand. And is uh, Allison Rao here? Yep, hey. Could you tell me how, to, how, we, how we get that? How do we derive that formula? Um, by If you want, you can come up here and write on the slide. <laughs> well, so we know that the expression for the monopoly, <coughs> right, is uh, for the uh, marginal revenue is P plus P prime times Q. So can anyone... Can we add in a... Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. 